Thank you for joining us this morning at Crossroads Community Church. Be sure to tune in before service starts for information on all of our ongoing programs and activities. Here's what's new. Crossroads Youth Ministry will be hosting our first annual youth shoot on Saturday, August 22nd from 3 to 9 p.m. There will be separate stations which will include handguns, long guns, skeet shooting, and archery. At each station, students will work one-on-one -on -one with experienced adults. With hunting being a common interest in our community, we at Crossroads see the value of our students learning safe and respectful handling of those weapons. This is a free event with dinner and snacks provided. Anyone entering 6th through 12th grade is welcome to join us. Please contact us at youth at c3stockbridge.org or 740-503-0636 as soon as possible so we can get your child registered before the deadline of August 15th. Incredible, incredible riches of your grace. And right now, we're going to take a moment, Lord, and I'm going to be quiet, but I would like to have every person here, Lord, take a moment looking through our lives and thanking you specifically for a few things that you have forgiven in us. So I want you to take a moment right now in your own heart and mind. Think about what God has forgiven you of and tell him thanks. Lord, if we were honest, we could go on for a really, really long time. Especially some of us. Especially me. Lord, I pray that you will help us to never take for gratitude your amazing grace. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Just a quick reminder about these wonderful things that we get to be still using. I uh, thank, uh, thank you that we're using these. I hate them. But... The reality is that's what we're dealing with these days. I pray that God will give us grace during this time to know how to interact with each other and be with each other. Um, I also want you to keep in mind these stickers. If you don't want contact, then don't use a sticker. But if you have a sticker on that says shake, you're welcome to shake hands. Um, if, you, if you're one who has a hug on, you're welcome to shake hands or hug, or you can always just stay with the wave, whatever. But if somebody does not have a sticker on, just wave at them, okay? Because that's their way of saying, it may be that they are at risk, or it may be that they have a family member who is at risk, and they are protecting. I have a friend um, in Mason. She's a, she's a hugger. But her mom is very, very susceptible to anything. So she keeps her distance and waves no matter where you run across her. So if people don't have a sticker on, honor that, okay? Um, also, as I mentioned last week, I'll mention again, there are those who sometimes um, feel like the announcements, things like that, are an interruption of the flow. The reality is, they are, they are worship every bit as much as everything else because it has to do with how we live our life together. And so we've been worshiping through the music. We've been worshiping through greeting each other. We're going to be worshiping through hearing the word and um, being changed by it. We're going to be worshiping, not right now through the offering, but when you do that. And by the way, thank you for all of you who are being so faithful. Those who are at home, I think it's probably possible that those who are giving from home are more faithful than the ones that are here because um, if you're like me, you probably get in your vehicle on the way home and go, oh, I forgot to put this in. So it may be that those who are using bill pay from home are actually being more consistent on that. But quite honestly, Crossroads, you guys have really impressed me with the fact that you have remained faithful in that way. It's fun to see how God's church is working together. 
Um, so those blue boxes are out there. You're welcome to put those to use on the way out or just sign up and do the regular bill pay thing. But we are going to have a couple of announcements that we're going to have on the videos, and I, I encourage you to look at them, and you might look at them and go, well, that doesn't apply to me. Yes, it does. Because there's probably somebody in your life who would be the right age or demographic for certain things that are in the announcements, and this is an opportunity for you, for you to encourage your loved one or family member or neighbor or whatever to be a part of these things. So look for your own learning, but also look for who else it may benefit. So go ahead and roll those, would you, Kay, please? Thank you for joining us this morning at Crossroads Community Church. Be sure to tune in before service starts for information on all of our ongoing programs and activities. Here's what's new. Crossroads Youth Ministry will be hosting our first annual youth shoot on Saturday, August 22nd from 3 to 9 p.m. There will be separate stations which will include handguns, long guns, skeet shooting, and archery. At each station, students will work one-on-one -on -one with experienced adults. With hunting being a common interest in our community, we at Crossroads see the value of our students learning safe and respectful handling of those weapons. This is a free event with dinner and snacks provided. Anyone entering 6th through 12th grade is welcome to join us. Please contact us at youth at c3stockbridge.org or 740-503-0636 as soon as possible so we can get your child registered before the deadline of August 15th. The um, last couple of days, I had opportunity to be on the road. Uh, my wife is from Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, which is south central Pennsylvania, and we were out there. We had to take care of some things, and on the way back, we crammed a nine-hour drive into about 14 hours uh, because we end up doing all sorts of side trips in the process, and that was normal, but... That gave me a lot of time yesterday to think about what I was going to say today. And as I was thinking about that, there was um, a time where we were able to hear Chuck Swindoll. We only heard him for just a couple minutes before we went through a tunnel. And after that, we couldn't hear the radio anymore and didn't pick up anything more from him. But Chuck Swindoll asked a question that I would really like to point your direction right now. Whose life is being changed through you? Whose life has been changed through you? Do you know that every one of us is a life changer? We have an influence on others because there are people that are watching us. There are people that are seeing us. There are people that are being influenced by us all the time. So the question is, who is being changed by your life, either for better or for worse? Because it is happening. Whether you like to acknowledge it, whether you like to take responsibility or not, it is happening. A friend of mine, years ago, um, my practice is, if you lead somebody to Christ, you're the ones who get to baptize them. Okay? I don't baptize as many people as, um, as have come to Christ under ministry because we like to have the people who accept Christ then have those who have brought them to Christ do the baptizing. Okay? I don't know what your practice has been here, but that's the way it is. And... Um, one of the guys who was getting baptized, he asked this friend of mine to be one of the ones to baptize him. And this friend that was asked to help baptize him came to me and said, I'm scared to death. I didn't know that anybody watched me because he was a good old boy Christian. You know what a good old boy Christian is? Everybody likes to talk to him out in the entryway or around. He's always got stories. He's always friendly, shaking hands. I don't know what he's doing during COVID. But anyhow, he's shaking hands. He's having a good time. He's laughing and talking. He reads the Bible occasionally. He goes to church and occasionally would pay attention to the sermons, things like that. But what happened was this other man came to him and said, you have had a huge impact on me spiritually. And this friend of mine was like, oh, No. Because the recognition was, if others are watching him, maybe he should pay more attention to what he was doing. And the reality is, every one of us 
is influencing others for better or for worse. Because by your proclamation of faith, by your presence at church, when people look at you, they go, okay, that's what a Christian is like. So they look at a guy like Dirk and they go, okay, so to be a guy at Crossroads, what you do is read the Bible once every five years and occasionally... <laughs> Well, if once in a while, you know, pray before ball games or whatever. Uh, now, I don't know what people see in dirt during the, during the week. I don't know what people see in you during the week. But the reality is, the moment you are seen as being a Christ follower, other people measure Christianity through that. I, I talked to you before about this whole process of the spectrum this chair in the spiritual spectrum is someone who has no real God interest. They don't understand God. They have no interest. They're just content with not knowing anything about God. This person over here is someone who is fully devoted, fully understanding, and they, you know, they're the saint. Okay, they're, they've got it going on spiritually. The spiritual the spectrum, the continuum from here to there, we are all somewhere along that line. There's someone with a little more spiritual interest, a little bit more spiritual interest. But here in the middle, it just happens on the communion table, there is a cross which represents that somewhere in the process from there to there, they have to come to the point where they come to, they have their come to Jesus moment, where they choose to become a Christ follower. Here they're understanding more about God, they're learning more about God, but at the point they decide to follow Christ, then it is a process of being sanctified and purified and developed toward maturity. You got that sense of the continuum, right? Here's what a lot of people do. They go, oh man, You say, I'm lost for eternity if I don't accept Christ, then I better accept Christ. (sighs) And they settle in right here. I've bought my fire insurance, I'm good for eternity, now I don't have to do anything. Is that obedient to Scripture? No. But what happens is, when people come in and they settle in at believer without really growing in their understanding and commitment and maturity, every other person who walks into the church sees this whole pile up of people sitting right here, accepted Christ, but it hasn't changed anything. And they influence every person who walks in the door or who sees them to become a fire insurance and nothing else. Okay? That is not what God has in mind, and I've been going through the book of Ephesians because I want you to understand that the book of Ephesians is all about, remember those numbers I've told you? One to one for one. One to one for one. That is the process of helping people go from here, gently moving them toward the understanding of what it is to follow Christ, and then helping them toward maturity. That is called making disciples. And if you are a Christ follower, you are supposed to be all about the one-to-one for one. Ephesians chapters 1, 2, and 3 that we've been talking about for the last, well, we were talking about, that's all about why you would ever go from here to here. It's all the good stuff God has done, all the grace, all of, we sang about it, amazing grace, the amazing grace that God has given us. All of Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 is saying, God has done this, so you should join the party. Ephesians 4, 5, and 6 says, this is how it looks after you've become a Christ follower. And that's where we're going to be dealing today in Ephesians chapter 5 is some of the this is what it looks like to follow Christ. We've been talking about that already, but we're going to talk in some specific things today on it as well. 
But understand this. Everything about the book of Ephesians is absolutely positive in nature. Look at the incredible, wonderful things God has done. Look at how awesome it is to follow him. It's all positive. Yes, in order to have all the positives, you have to take care of some of the negatives. The doctor says, if you're going to be healthy, you have to stop this. You have to stop that. You have to stop the other thing. And for some of us, there's a really long list of the things we need to stop. But the doctor's being positive, saying, if you want to be healthy. Now, sometimes doctors are negative, say, and they say, if you don't want to die, you better. But the reality is the doctor wants you to be happy and healthy. In the same way, Ephesians 4, 5, and 6 is all about how we can have the life of joy that we're supposed to have filled with the fruit of the Spirit. So with this in mind, what I would like to do is I'd like you to follow along. I actually have it on the screen. We're going to, um, and by the way, Kay, you did a great job of staying with me during the first service, okay? Because in that 14-hour trip yesterday, I completely revamped what I was going to talk about this morning. So the PowerPoint became obsolete. So Kay is going to work with me on this. Thank you for that. All right, so I want to just read this passage to you. You can follow along up here or follow along on the notes that you have, or you can uh, follow along in your own Bibles, okay? But I'm going to read it off the screen because it's a lot easier to read than these little things in front of me. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. In other words, you were over here, but now you're here. Live as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, all positive. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. I'm not going to talk about that, exposing the deeds of darkness. I'm going to let you and the Holy Spirit spend some time on that one. I encourage you to spend some time on that because it is one of the instructions we have is to expose the things of wickedness. It is shameful even to mention what, is, what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. That is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. And we're going to stop there for a second, because I'm not going to cover this later, and I would like to cover it for just a moment. Do you know that there are different types of church music? Psalms. A psalm is a song where you sing scripture. Scripture. Okay, that's what Psalms refers to. Psalms where you sing scripture. It's a great way to memorize scripture. There are lots of songs out there um, that have scripture. Some of them are kind of silly. Be ye kind one to another, tender art of forgiving one another, even as God for Christ hath forgiven you. Do, 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 Ephesians 4.32. That's a psalm. That's, that's a scripture song. Okay? What's a hymn? A hymn is what is pointed toward God. Possibly one of the most famous ones is, a mighty fortress is our God. Okay? That's all about God. A lot of us tend to think of hymns as being the ones that are in a book with four verses in a chorus or a refrain. No. Hymn has to do with the direction of the song, the subject of the song, the purpose of the song. If it's to glorify God, it's to, if it's to praise God, it's a hymn. So you have ones where you sing scripture. You have ones that are just all about God. So what are songs? Songs are the ones that have to do with my experience with God. And actually, if you look through the book of Psalms, there are an awful lot of them that are about David's experience. They would be songs that are in the book of Psalms. And so it's perfectly acceptable for us in church to sing songs that are about our experience. In fact, we already did it. Would this is amazing grace, would that be a hymn or a song? That's more a song than it is a hymn. But of course, it has some hymn component. But even 
a mighty fortress is our God, still has somewhat about our benefit of that. So that's a hymn with a little bit of songishness in it. Does that make sense? So God created us to rejoice in and love music. And it says, sing and make music from, from your heart to the Lord. So it is perfectly appropriate to have those psalms and hymns and songs because they touch different parts of us. Psalms, hymns, songs. But it says, that's what you need to do. But it then says, sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. There are some of us that only sound good to God. Okay? And that's perfectly okay, because God rejoices in the sounds of Lifting a joyful noise, even if nobody else wants to sit near you. But that's okay. Because it is making music in your heart to the Lord. Okay, let's go on. Need verse 20 up there, please, Kay. There we go. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The umbrella for all of this is always having a thankful heart. Now let's go back and look at some of these specific things. Verse 10, find out, well, let me use a little bit of a, an illustration on this. When you're dating, do you relate with the one you love a little bit more, a little bit different than the way you relate to your spouse? When you're dating, what you're always doing is looking for what will make your the object of your affection, go, oh. Is, and that's exactly what we do when we're married, right? It's always about the desires and needs of our spouse, right? I'm not hearing any amens. Because the reality is we kind of get, all right, I've conquered that, now I'll do what I want. Uh, when you're courting, when you're dating, you find out what pleases them and do that. And that's the same concept in this verse. Find out what pleases the Lord. And then I would add the phrase that Nike had for several years as their slogan. What is it? Just do it. Find out what pleases your spouse. Find out what pleases your loved one and do it. In the same way, find out what pleases the Lord and do it. And scripture does not hesitate in giving instructions. Do you know what pleases the Lord more than anything? You and me making disciples. That's called obedience. So when I take my friend who has no understanding of Christ and I help him to love Christ and his church more, I'm making disciples and that pleases God. So find out what pleases the Lord and do it. When I'm working with the elders and helping them to understand more and more of what God wants... I'm pleasing God because I'm making disciples and that is what pleases the Lord. If you've got a new convert and you are helping them to understand the basis of faith, you're obedient, you are making disciples, you are pleasing the Lord. Find out what pleases the Lord and do it. And if there's something that does not please the Lord, guess what you should do? Don't do it. Get it out of your life. Okay? So as you read scripture, go back to one of my favorites from Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 29, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. What should you do if you realize you're saying something unwholesome? Stop it. <laughs> Just clam it shut and you might need to apologize and say, you know what? What I was just saying was not benefiting anybody. It was just plain nasty. It was mean. It was vulgar. I'm sorry, that does not represent Jesus well. What would that say to the people who are around you regarding Christ and Christians? That would be a really, really powerful statement about how we care about our faith, wouldn't it? Find out what pleases the Lord and do it. Go down to verse 13. Live as children of the light and what will happen to you? You'll be a light. You'll become a light. As you live 
in Christ's way, pleasing to him, you will not only reflect his light, you will become a light. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, Jesus said, let your light so shine among men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You are a light that is shining. Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, it says that in the midst of this crooked and perverse generation, we as obedient children will shine like stars in the universe. This is a time of year when I love being in Ludington. There is always this time of year, what, what is there that happens at night? A meteor shower. And I have not found a better place in recent years than to go north of Ludington onto the beach out toward the state park and just go out there and lay on the beach and look up. And I see those stars that are like two or three miles up there. Right? They are way, way, way out there. But yet we see them because they shine like stars in the universe. What does God desire from our lives? That we shine like stars in the universe in a crooked and perverse generation. And so maybe someday if our culture ever becomes crooked and perverse, you'll have opportunity to shine as a bright, holy, godly example. That probably won't happen in our lifetime. <coughs> 14, there's a comparison there. Look what it says in verse 14. Uh, let's see. I actually have capability to advance that. Okay, got called away for a second. So let's get down to verse 14. That is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This whole idea goes with what is being said right around those verses about fruit versus fruitless. All of us have family members or neighbors or friends that are right here. They have no understanding of Christ. They have no understanding of salvation. They have no clue about that. Do you know that according to Scripture, do you know what is going to happen to the people in this chair? Do you know what is going to happen to those really, really nice people who have never put their faith in Christ? They are condemned for eternity because they have rejected Jesus Christ, God's, own, God's one and only Son. If we believe that, wake up, sleepers. We need to be praying with broken hearts and saying, you know what? By the time this year is over, I've got to help them to know and understand why I go to church, why I follow Christ, why I do what I do, because it's not about fire insurance. It's about all of eternity, and it's about all of the present day life. Now, the whole idea of finding out what pleases the Lord, one of the best ways to find out what pleases the Lord, that was back in verse 10, that has to do with looking in his word and knowing. Right? So that's why when I'm around believers, and I do this with staff, and I've done that with some others, I will ask you this question. So, Dirk, what are you reading in Scripture these days? He's reading Romans. If I ask you what you're reading in Scripture, and you go, ah, blah, 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 blah. that's not a good sign for your health, right? And I take it further, and I say, so what have you memorized recently? What are you memorizing? Why is that so important? Because Scripture says we're supposed to not just read it, but meditate it on it. Meditate on it day and night. Because that's when it really infiltrates our heart and mind and priorities, and we become what Christ wants. 
But when you get to this wake up, O oh sleeper, and this idea about the lostness of people, I ask a further question. So who are you praying that God will give you the privilege of leading into the kingdom? To be in the birthing room of someone who goes from lost for eternity to, be, to being saved for eternity, who are you praying that God will help you to bring to Christ? And if you are not already doing that, then wake up, O oh sleeper. Rise from the dead because if you care about these people who don't know Christ... You got to do something about it. Back to a question you may have heard a couple times. So, what you going to do about it? Okay. Being fruitful has the fruit of the spirit: the love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, all those things. But it also is the fruit of reproducing your faith in others. And by the way, we are reproducing our faith in others. If we have dead faith, everybody who imitates us is going to have dead. Dead, dead, dead. Down to verse 15. Um, by the way, this verse 15 is one that I have couples memorize in premarital counseling. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. I give them the three-word version of it. I may have mentioned this to you before. The three-word version of Ephesians 5.15, everyone here can memorize. By the way, some of you say, I really can't memorize things. This is show and tell time. Why don't you be honest? How many of you do not know your name? Raise your hand. How many of you do not know your phone number? How many of you do not know your address? Guess what? We have the ability to memorize things that really matter to us. So let me give you a verse to memorize today. Ephesians 5.15, the three-word version. Don't be stupid. Got it? Say it with me. Don't be stupid. Now apply that to your marriage. And I tell couples, if every time you think about doing something that would irritate or frustrate or make your spouse mad, don't do it. Do you know that most couples would reach death due part if neither one did stupid stuff? You understand that, right? But you see, this applies way beyond marriage. This applies to every aspect of life. If you're thinking about doing something you know it's sin, don't do it. So, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil and the reality is we will be tempted to do stupid things. Let's go a little further down. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. What was the Lord's will? I have people come to me different times through life and say, I don't know what God's will is for my life. Well, that's because you haven't read Scripture. Do you know what God's will is for your life? One, two, one, four, one. Whether you do it in a school, whether you do it in a factory, whether you do it in a neighborhood, whether you do it in a family, God's will for you is one, two, one, four, one. Yeah, but I don't know what God really wants me to do. One, two, one, four, one. And as you are active in doing that, he's going to put you in the place where you can have the most impact through one, two, one, four, one. And everything's just going to kind of fall in there. And if at some point you're going, okay, I understand one to one for one, but I don't know whether to take job A or job B. Ask God. James chapter 1 says if anybody lacks wisdom, ask God. He gives generously. And if you've asked and asked and asked and he doesn't tell you whether it's job A or job B, what he's telling you is either one's acceptable because there are lost people in each of those situations that need you to be one to one for one with them there. But what's God's will? It is very clearly our will is to make disciples. Now, 
I want to look for a moment about what it is that undermines our ability to be wise. Chapter 5, verse 18 says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Now, first of all, let's take a look at debauchery. What is debauchery? It is overdoing anything. Debauchery with wine is drunkenness. Debauchery with food is debauchery with being a sun worshiper is sunburn. Okay? I mean, it's, it's do not get drunk on anything which leads to debauchery. Some of us get drunk on work. Some of us get drunk on pleasure. Some of us get drunk on all sorts of things. It says, do not be drunk on any of that because it leads to debauchery. What is it that causes you to lose your inhibitions? Have you ever heard the term hangry? Because hunger causes you to become less godly. My parents taught us nothing good happens after midnight because in our household, there was somebody in our household who could not have a good discussion after 10 o'clock, so my wife made the rule that we wouldn't have any serious discussions after 10. I'm not going to name names. Okay? But the reality was it's better to not discuss serious stuff after 10 because it gets ugly. Because fatigue causes... There are all sorts of things that cause us to lose our judgment. Just because it says wine, you well, I don't even drink, so I don't have to worry about that verse. Don't do anything that leads you away from wisdom. And then it goes on to say, be filled with the Spirit, and the Spirit will guide you into all truth. He will guide you into all understanding, and you can assist in that by having music that goes through your heart. But the bottom line is this. Always be full of thanksgiving, seeing what God has done and all the benefits that you have because that will continue to move, move you forward with refreshing. And as people see you being continually refreshed, they'll want what you have. There was a study done many, many years ago about why PKs. You know what PKs are? Preacher's kids? Okay. They did a study about why a lot of preacher's kids stopped being involved in church. Now, some preacher's kids are near perfect, okay? But there are some who reject all of the Christ stuff. And when they did a study on that, what they discovered is this. Those whose parents love Christ in his church, their kids tended to love Christ in his church. I realize this is not absolute, but this is a tendency. But those who rejected Christ in his church, what they discovered was those kids generally said, yeah, my dad felt like church was just a job, something he had to do. Oh, uh, tomorrow morning I've got to go to church. <sighs> What that interpreted into was a heart without thanksgiving, and the kids saw that church was drudgery, not a joy. On Saturday, what are you teaching your family and friends about Sunday? Oh, I got to go to church. I committed to be in the nursery. I committed to do this. I committed to. Or is it tomorrow morning? <clears throat> I get to play guitar at church. I love it. I get to be a part of orchestrating the time of fellowship when we sing songs together. I love it. Your kids get the idea that it's a joy. So, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let your heart be full of thanks as you make disciples. And what will take place is you'll be far more effective in making disciples when you have a heart of joy. Then you go, oh, Steve's making me go out and talk to somebody about Christ. I know that Steve's going to ask me what I've been reading lately, so I've got to read the Bible. I know what Steve's going to do. Next time I see him, he's going to say, hey, what are you memorizing? 
Ugh. By the way, Rick, if I see you on Wednesday morning hankered, I'm apt to ask you what you're reading. You better be ready. Okay? I'll probably ask about the memorizing thing, too. And tomorrow morning at staff meeting, Sam, what are you going to get asked? All three of those questions. Why? Because it's a part of the way that we sharpen each other. And everybody who makes it a practice to be disciplined in reading and memorizing and praying and reaching their lost friends, do you know what their hearts are full of? Joy and thanksgiving. Do you know what those who are not doing any of the things, you know what the, the people who are here, they're the grumblers. Let's go to Cedar Point for a moment. I realized I didn't talk about this in the first service, so sorry. The grumblers. If you go to Cedar Point, they have these cattle things, right? And you go back and forth. The gate's right there, but you've got to walk three miles to get there. But I've discovered something. As long as we're doing this or even this, all we're doing is talking about the excitement of the ride. But the moment it's this way, do you know what happens with people standing in line instead of walking in line? They mumble and grumble. Ah, oh, I wonder if somebody fell off again. <laughs> wonder if the ride's broken. Oh, I hate standing in line this way. When you're moving forward, it's the excitement of this must be an awesome ride because we have so many people in line to being, oh, what a pain. Why are we waiting? Same is true here. If you say, all right, I accept Christ, and you do nothing more, you will become a grumbler and a mumbler and a pain in the pew for everybody else. But if you are making disciples, you're going to be a joy to be around. Period. All right, Lord, help us. Help us to be committed to being what you want. Help us to find what pleases you. Help us to do it then with a heart full of thanksgiving, making the most of every opportunity in this evil and wicked time. We'll give you the praise, Lord. Amen.